So as they announced, my name is Courtney Kane, and thanks you guys for staying. It's been kind of a long night, but I'll try my best this evening. So I'm going to take you through my journey towards getting a PhD. Now, this story doesn't start exactly at that moment, so I have to take you back a little bit. So as the youngest daughter of two Haitian immigrants, Raymond and Yannick, there were several family ideals that were huge in my household. Discipline, or in my dad's words, discipline. <laughs> Perseverance, always making sure you would get over that hump. Family and community. And education, a love of learning. Now, the reason that my dad left Haiti in 1968 was because he had a vision. He saw himself giving himself and his family a better life. And what was contingent upon that better life was educational opportunities. So he left Haiti at the age of 25, came to Chicago, sent for my mom, who was only 19 at the time, a year later. And they worked hard, blue collar jobs, to make sure that my sisters and I would have that better life. Now, my oldest sister, Nadine, became a doctor. And my next sister, Daphne, became a lawyer. Then there's me. I was hoping that just being cute would work out for me, but at some point, I figured I would have to do something. But what was that something? Again, a lot to live up to, a doctor, a lawyer, and cute is not really how that was going to go. What would that look like for me? So, so second, it was after my sophomore year of college that I received an email about a summer internship for those who were interested in, in perhaps getting a PhD, going to graduate school. Hmm, that seemed like potential. Maybe a PhD would be something that I could do. So I applied, got into the internship. It's called the Summer Research Opportunities Program at U of I. And I spent 10 weeks researching something that I loved and writing a paper and presenting it. It's me and my poster presentation. And it was it. I felt it. That was what I was going to do. I was going to go to school, and I was going to get a PhD in my favorite subject, history. Yes, I'm one of those people. History has always been my favorite subject. And I thought, I could do this, man. Like, grammar school was easy. High school was pretty easy. College, pretty easy. Getting a PhD, be pretty, pretty easy. And I was wrong. I was horribly wrong about that. Um, but what ended up getting me through that crazy seven-year journey towards a PhD were those family ideals that had been instilled in me. Perseverance, a love of learning and education, family support, community support, and discipline. Those would get me through. And I think those could get you through as well. And I'll show you how. Well, let's take it to not even getting right away into the program, thinking about getting into the program. The GRE, the Graduate Record Examination, the bane of my existence. Now, I prepared for the GRE because it was part of every application that I had to do and went to go take the test. Now, I remember I walked into the room and I immediately felt like a hamster in a cage because it was literally like a cubicle that you had to sit in to take a test. I sat there, I started to take the test, and I got hot. I'm kind of a hot person anyway, so I was like, okay, this is, my, this is normal. And then I started to sweat. But again, that's typical, so I was like, okay. But then I got dizzy, and then I started to feel slightly nauseous. So I immediately raised my hand above my cubicle and asked where the nearest bathroom was. And I ran out. I ran to the bathroom and I got sick, really sick. And I looked at myself in the mirror and I just cried. How was I going to get into school if I can't even take the entrance exam? What was this going to mean? I'd set my sights on this. This is what I was supposed to do. I wiped the tears from my eyes, went back into the room and finished the test. And let's just say my scores reflected that incident in the bathroom. So I went back home. 
I studied, and I said, I'll take it again. I persevered. Went for a second time, same cage-like experience, same sorts of things start to happen the second time. Start to feel sick, hot, sweaty. By the time the nausea set in, I told myself, no, no, Courtney. You are going to do this. Take the test and finish it. So I did. My scores were a little bit better, but that was enough. So I figured, OK, score's not looking that good. Everything else may look a little good. Let me go talk to somebody in the admissions department of the school I want to apply to and see if maybe there's some way they can give me some information on maybe make my application better. So I sat down with the chair of the history department at the time and sat down with a big smile on my face. And I was like, I want to come to school here, get my PhD. She looked at me and said, no. <laughs> that was it. She said, no. I was like, why? <laughs> um, and she was like, because you've done your bachelor's here, and we do not accept students who did their bachelor's here. I was like, why? I don't, I don't understand. Um, and so I got my bag. I thanked her. And I remember grumbling to my car. This doesn't make any sense. I just took the GRE twice at the school school I want to go to. But I was like, you know what? Nobody tells a Haitian person no. <laughs> I'm going to apply. And I did. And I got in. I persevered. I didn't listen to the no. I didn't listen to that gut. So that got me through the door. And starting August of 2010, I actually began my real journey towards a PhD. Now, I thought this, by this point, was going to be pretty simple. Had some stuff go wrong. Again, wrong, Courtney, wrong. So the first part of my PhD process included getting into the program, like I said, but starting my classes, getting papers slaughtered. I mean, one paper came back to me, and it was, had so much editing on it that the professor just started writing across the page, across my writing. Yeah. But I was making it. But I knew I had something in my back pocket. I knew I had two advisors that I was going to work with while at the school. I felt good about it. They were both teaching things that I loved. We had a working relationship. It was going to be fine. Towards the end of the first year, I get an email from one of the professors asking me to come meet him in his office. And I thought, it's probably going to be one of those papers again. But it's OK. I'll survive it. I sat down. I looked at him. And he announced that he would be leaving the university at the end of the year. OK, a little destabilizing. But that's why I had two. You know it's called a backup plan. So I was like, this will be fine. Have a second one. Then a couple of weeks later, I got an email about that professor's departure from the university. Great. Great. Now what was I going to do? Both advisors are gone. Do I leave the school too? It's only my first year. <laughs> do I go with them? They weren't really asking me to go with them, so that wasn't a possibility. So what I do, I looked on the college website and in our department, and I just scrambled. Knew I wanted to learn from somebody. I was already learning so much. I didn't want to stop now. I found a professor who kind of did stuff I was interested in. And I remember going into his office. He had his feet up, propped up on the desk. And I was like, mm, hi. <laughs> I need an advisor. <laughs> and he was like, OK, take a class with me. We'll see how this goes. So that was a big class. And I had to make sure I shine bright like a diamond in the words of Rihanna. And I did. I did. And he signed me on to be his advisee. Great. Second year, late nights, reading three books a week, doing tons of response papers, sitting in three-hour seminars, arguing about things like feminism and globalism and all the isms. But it felt good. I was learning. I was learning things I wanted to learn. And it felt liberating. I could take classes about things I wanted to. Black women, there were tons of those classes. People who looked like me, there were tons of those classes. And it felt amazing. So by the time it was time for my third year, I knew what I wanted to research for the big shebang of your PhD, the dissertation. The ingenuity of an idea that nobody else had thought of but you, and you were going to write it. And I had it. 
Always loved learning about black women and civil rights, and I found an archival collection in Chicago that was untouched, or so I thought. And I was going to do it. So a new professor moved into our department, and I went to go meet with him. He had similar interests as me. And I sat down, and I told him what I was going to research, my grand dissertation idea. He took a sip of his coffee and said, I actually just went to a conference. I, somebody just deposited that dissertation. Hmm? I'm sorry. What? <laughs> he said, are you sure? He said, yeah, no, no, they do. So ran home again, went on the computer, did some more investigation, and he was right. The person at the University of Chicago had just deposited that dissertation. Now there were tears in my eyes this time. Now I was like, I'm halfway through. I've gotten the master's. I'm loving what I'm doing. But it's three months until I'm supposed to defend a dissertation idea, and now I have no idea what I'm going to do. So I looked at my then fiance, now husband, and I just said, what do I do? And he said, why don't you do something about being Haitian? You're always talking about being Haitian. And I was like, no, yes, I am. <laughs> so it dawned on me, huh, something about Haiti, where my parents were from. Apparently, what I always talk about. So I did some research, found out there wasn't a lot about Haitians in the United States, but specifically Haitians in Chicago. And I knew Haitians in Chicago existed because I was one of them. But nothing had been written about them. That was it. That was the topic. And it was that love of learning, but that family support that got me to that new topic. If it wasn't for my husband, I don't know what I would have decided at that point. That community and that love actually sent me on a journey of self-discovery and a topic that was perfect for me. In fact, that's what got me to go to Haiti for the very first time in my whole life. So one day while I was visiting my parents, I looked up at them in the kitchen and I said, I'm going to Haiti. And my dad said, you're not going anywhere without me. And I said, OK. <laughs> and then we called my sister Daphne, and she said, I've been waiting to go. Let's totally go. And then we just side-eyed my oldest sister, and she was like, OK, yeah. OK, guess I'm going to. Um, and then my mom deemed herself to be the dog babysitter, so she did not go, um, which is, was totally fine. But in December of 2015, I embarked on an almost week-long journey my father and my sisters, in our motherland, and it was everything. I immediately felt something inside of me that had been maybe void, that I didn't realize, was filled. I got to see family members I hadn't seen in years or had never met before. I got to drink a lot of prestige beer, which that's a thing, and it's so good. Everybody go to Haiti and drink prestige beer. I got to soak up the culture the land that was so close to me, because it's where my family is from, but also about what I was writing about. It made sense. So I came back, and I was ready to write. So I thought. Discipline, or discipline. That final year of graduate school, year seven, had to finish up. And so I buckled down. I was working and teaching a class. I was writing. I was editing. I was reading and editing and writing and teaching. But discipline, that's what got me through that final year. Even when it came time to do job applications. A crazy person. So my advisor looks at me in the middle of this final year and goes, you might want to think about what you're going to do when you finish. And I was like, well, why? Um, and he's like, you might want to think about that. So then he sends me on this journey of having to do job applications and personal statements and teaching statements and research statements and syllabi creation. That same GRE feeling washed over me again. But I landed a couple of interviews and ended up landing my dream job here at Lake Forest in two departments that had meant so much to me, history and African-American studies. Then I really had to be disciplined because I kind of needed to finish to really you know, start working. 
So I edited and wrote and edited and wrote and cried and edited and wrote and complained and edited and wrote. And finally, the day came. My dissertation defense. 269 pages of research. Seven years of my life came down to two hours. I sat in a room with my family, my parents and my husband in particular, my community, colleagues, friends, who came to support me, and also just in case things didn't go as planned, I was ready to go. I had my peoples with me, but it was fine. <laughs> Two hours of intense questioning. And finally, they let me back in their room and I saw my committee was clapping for me and they announced that I had passed. But I didn't hear them at first, it took a minute. Because suddenly, everything over the last seven years had washed over me, the GRE, that no, the losing of two advisors and the gaining of two more advisors after that. That Hail Mary pass from my husband for a dissertation topic. The trip to Haiti, that final year of so many sleepless and crazy nights of writing and editing. And then the tears hit. Because I realized I had done it. And how had I done it? Those four lessons, discipline, perseverance, family, and support from them, and a love of learning got me across that finish line. I walked that curved line to the PhD, and without those four things, I wouldn't have done it, and I wouldn't be the woman that I am today. I know that I can do anything. I know that if I'm disciplined enough and I hold myself up high enough that I can do it. And now I'm in a position to tell other students and other people to do the same thing. So four things you need to get a PhD, at least from my perspective, discipline, perseverance, a love of learning, and family. And you can do it too. Thank, Thank you. you so much.